in general, I don't think people really like to be a part of controversies. I think people like to stay away from conflict and from arguments, especially in public. To prove my point, all you have to do is look in a grocery store parking lot. Whenever you go to a grocery store parking lot, inevitably there's gonna be a family with multiple children and a parent has to go into the grocery store with all of these children. And if you pay attention, the parent is gonna bend down in the faces of these sweet little children and go, now you listen to me. (laughs) We're gonna be on our best behavior. We're gonna go into this store. We're not gonna touch anything that isn't ours. We're not gonna throw anything in the cart and we're not gonna mess with our siblings. And then we're gonna go. How many times have you been in a clothing store and there's a child that just can't help it? And the child takes the hand and goes all the way down the clothes and gets lost in the middle of the racks. And inevitably you hear a parent go, I've given you your last warning, that's it, no more ice cream. (laughs) Adults do the same thing. We can't help it. We get real nervous. Our bodies get real tense about some things. Maybe there's a big fundraiser or a big banquet or something you have to do at work or some big event in your life and you get a plus one or you get to bring your partner and all of a sudden you go, now look, this is a big deal for me. My colleagues are gonna be here. My supervisor's gonna be here. My boss is gonna be here. Some really my great friends that I'm just trying to impress because I'm not really sure I like them or not. This is a big deal for me, so let's just get through the night, let's get through the day, let's get through the event without any major issues. And it's funny because all it takes is like one word, one little laughter, one little sound, and we can get so embarrassed. It only takes a few seconds. If you don't like to be a part of what I always called making a scene. You should not take Jesus with you anywhere. Because wherever Jesus goes, there's always a problem. In my mind, I imagine the disciples bent over to Jesus and saying, look, we love you, but we're going to go into this marketplace. We're not going to touch anything that's not ours. We're going to keep the opinions to ourselves, and then we're going to leave peacefully, okay? Look, Jesus, we're going to walk into this synagogue. We're only going to teach the people who want to be taught. We're going to follow all the rules, and we're going to be on our best behavior, so then we can just go, okay? Inevitably, Jesus causes a scene wherever he goes. There is conflict, there's an argument, and there's a controversy. And one of the best examples of this is in Luke 13. We're going to read it together. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. And when he laid his hands on her, she immediately stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, there are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured. Not today on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, oh, you hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie an ox or donkey from the manger and lead it to water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, who Satan has bound for 18 long years, be set free from bondage on this Sabbath day? When he said this, all of his opponents were put to shame and the entire crowd was rejoicing 
and all the wonderful things that are being done. This story of this woman is actually a parable and the parable is called a controversy. And the parable is included not because of geographical information. It's not included for chronological reasons. This parable is only included as pedagogy for teaching. We know that Luke was a physician, or we think that Luke was a physician. And so doesn't it only make sense that Luke would use something medical or of science to make a point and to teach us? And there are a lot of things happening in this text. We could easily think about the idea of being bound versus being free. And we could think about the case that's being built in Luke against Jesus. We could even think about this word hypocrite because Jesus uses it a lot and it's a harsh word, but he uses it against church leaders. So if you're the kind of person that likes to journal or likes to write or likes to think through things in a devotion, those are all very good things to think about. What I really like about this text is that we don't know a lot about this woman. And so we're free to imagine. We don't know how old she is. We know that she's been crippled for 18 years. So maybe she's 18. Maybe she's 38. Maybe she's 68. Maybe she's 108. We have no idea about her family. Maybe she's single. Maybe she's just in a committed relationship. Maybe she's married. Does she have a child? Does she not have a child? How many does she have? We don't even know what she did for work. Maybe she was a dressmaker. Maybe she's a homemaker. Or maybe she's a scientist or a physician. Maybe she's just retired. All we know about this woman is that she's bent over and she goes into the synagogue and we get to go with her. And so here we are walking bent down into the chapel on the designated day of worship and whatever we deemed appropriate for the day. And here we are with her finding our places in the place of worship in the pews. And we're trying just to find somewhere to be. We're not there looking for a miracle. We're not here looking for any kind of special healing. We're not here looking to be seen or see someone in particular. We're just here because that's what we do. Now for me, if I go to church or if I go to any kind of meeting or event, I'm gonna look for a place, easy entry and easy exit. I want to be able to fly under the radar. I want to be able to sit in the back and kind of cut up a little bit and nobody really know. So that's where I'm going to be. I know y'all are kind of the same because I watch you find your spots here. And I know all the kids are really excited about going up front and all the parents are like, you know what, maybe we should go back here. <laughs> We're with this woman finding our place just so that we can get settled. And we're not there to see anything major. But we know other people are. There's a hemorrhaging woman who reaches out to touch the fringe on the cloak of Jesus. There's a man on a mat whose friends have to actually take him down through the roof. There's a little man named Zacchaeus and he climbs a tree just to be with Jesus. Those are people looking for Jesus. This woman is not one of them. She's minding her own business when Jesus finds her. There's a joke in my family. And the joke is that the only reason my mom and dad ever fell in love was because at that high school dance, my father, who was 6'4", looked over the crowd and all he saw was my mother, who was 5'11". And the only reason my mom said yes to the dance is because my dad was the only one that was taller than she was. 
How did Jesus see this woman in a crowd? She was not standing ahead above anyone. Quite the opposite. She probably was lost in the crowd. And Jesus was actually having to like look around and bend down and people were probably talking to him and he's like, uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, doing one of those things while he's trying to talk, but he's trying to look around too to see who's coming. She was minding her own business and Jesus saw her and approached her. Didn't even look her in her eye and said, woman, you are free. And in that moment, this woman was pulled in to one of the biggest controversies and conflicts and arguments. Jesus was a Jewish man and he was not supposed to speak to a woman. He was not supposed to touch a woman, especially one that's unclean with a problem. He wasn't supposed to bring that woman into the center and say, look what I'm about to do on this special day. And if that weren't enough, he really wasn't supposed to say, by the way, God did not hurt her. Bad things just happen sometimes. And the icing on the cake, to top it all off, Jesus calls her something very, very specific, a daughter of Abraham. It's never been used before, so right here in this story is the very first time a woman is given equal membership in a place of worship. In seven verses, Jesus makes a huge scene and it took just a few seconds. A life in Christ is like that. Our lives in Christ are exactly like that. Making a scene just to be surprised that leads to a deeper faith. Because here we are bent over in our work, bent over at school, bent over in whatever drama is happening around us. And we're just trying to get through the day without any major issues. We're trying to go a little unnoticed, flying under the radar so that we don't have any big conflict or argument or anything unsettling around us. And what will happen throughout that day, throughout that drama or work or school or just life is something will happen and all of a sudden we will feel the pain of it. Maybe the illness is too much. Maybe the marriage hurts. Maybe the divorce hurts. Maybe the addiction is too much. Maybe the words are too much. Whatever it is, maybe something new is just too much. And what God is trying to do, God is saying, I will touch you, I will speak to you, I will put you in the center. Because for me, you have equal membership in all things, no matter what the world around you says. In the Old Testament, there's a woman named Sarah. She's married to Abraham, and she's just hanging at her house, minding her own business, and a stranger comes. And when the stranger comes, Sarah immediately goes into the kitchen, and what does she do? she bends over and begins to make cakes. God meets her in the kitchen while she's bent over cooking and says, you're gonna have a baby. And that baby named Isaac is gonna lead a nation. And we know the scene that that cost. There in the New Testament is a man named Simon and he's from a place called Cyrene and he's minding his own business just standing in the crowd. And he's picked out out of everybody and says, you, you come over here, you bend down and pick up this cross. And Simon could have been like, no. <laughs> he could have looked around and be like, you're talking to somebody else, right? And ignored the whole thing, but he didn't. 
he bent down next to Jesus and he carried that cross. And we know the scene that that created. Over and over again, we have examples of God bending down to say, I will help you. I know some of you know this, just in case you don't, I'll remind you, for a little bit in my life, I was the executive director of a place called Sanctuary. It was um, a nonprofit that helped victims of domestic and sexual violence. And I remember very vividly, very vividly, this one woman. And as soon as she came in the door, I noticed that she was bent over. She walked into sanctuary that day with three things, two broken ribs and a baby, <laughs> this little boy. And she bent over to protect him. And they walked like that for several days. <laughs> And as they got kind of comfortable with where they were in the halls and with all of us, they began to separate a little bit more. And the little boy got so comfortable, he would run ahead of his mom to the cafeteria. And then when he finished, he'd get so comfortable, he'd run outside and play with his friends in the little gated area. And before long, the mom got comfortable and she started going to group therapy and individual counseling. And they began to really flourish. Well, a few weeks later, another hurdle came. It was time for the little boy to go to school. All of a sudden, the mom began to bend over to protect him more. She was very nervous. The little boy was very nervous, didn't want to go to school, didn't want to go to school. I mean, who, who's ready to go to school? Who really wants to go to school? But this boy, little boy, didn't want to go. It was time to catch the school bus. He wouldn't get on it. So one of the staff, one of the children's workers said, no problem, I'll take you to school. You and your mom, get in the car, we'll head out. Drove him straight to the school, went right up to the front door and the little boy refused to budge. He was not getting out of the car. The children's staff person walked, opened up the big van door got down in the face, bent down and said, you got to go to school. And then he said, I'll help you. And then they walked. A few weeks later, I was invited to speak to this school, same exact one. And I was invited to talk to all the teachers and all the faculty and all of the students, all crammed into the gym, all on the bleachers, and I was to tell them about how to stay safe. So they handed me a microphone and I begin my spiel. My name is, I'm from, we serve nine counties. And as soon as I got started with my spiel, there was a little boy in the corner of my eye raising his hand. Of course I recognize him. I don't wanna make a scene. I don't want to embarrass him, so I ignore him. I keep going. I work at a place where we have a lot of different opportunities for moms to stay safe, for kids to stay safe at school. We have a way for your moms to have protective orders so they can come, da, da, da. And I'm going on and I'm going on with all this very helpful information. And sure enough, this little boy cannot stand it. And he's like, oh, oh. And he is making his own little scene. He is not following the rules. It was funny. He was not following the rules that you're supposed to wait. He was almost coming off of his little chair. Well, I must have stopped talking in just enough time for him to have a word. And he stood straight up, walked down those bleachers, came right over to me, pulled me down, I bent down, he took the microphone away from me, pushed me to the side and says, she doesn't know anything. Let me tell you about sanctuary. And he said, sanctuary is a place that gives you pancakes for breakfast. He said, sanctuary is a place to give you cookies when you get home. Sanctuary is a place where your mom starts to get a little happier. 
Sanctuary is a place that lets kids smile again and you're not scared anymore. And then he said, sanctuary is also a place where they'll walk you into school when you don't want your mom to do it. This little girl out of nowhere, she said, well, how do you know so much? And the little boy said, because I live there. And don't you know, every single little hand went up in that gym. Every one of them wanted to have a question. And I looked at the little boy and the little boy looked at me and he said, don't worry, I'll help you. (laughs) Being a faithful member of the Christian faith being a son of Abraham, being a daughter of Abraham, it means knowing that in just a few seconds, God is gonna make an amazing scene to help you. Amen. Pray with me. Gracious and holy Lord, we are thankful for all that you have done for us. And we are thankful that you love us no matter what. But for those times that we haven't been on our best behavior, for those times that maybe we've said things we, weren't, we shouldn't have said, or maybe we were places we shouldn't have been, or just in situations that did more harm than good, for all of it, Lord, we are sorry. And we ask for you to forgive us. But we ask you too, Lord, to give us a new day and a new week where we can do better. And Lord, those things in our lives that may need your gentle touch to pull us up, to straighten us up, we ask that you show them to us so that we can breathe again and that we can figure out what wording or what action or what people we need to be a part of. Lord, there are so many hurts. And so for whatever they may be on our mind, wrap your loving arms around them and put us as some of those people that feel like they can't stand up on their own, may we be the ones that offer them support. May we put our arm around them. Or if we're the one that needs help, Lord, may you put us in the path of someone to help. And Lord, there are things that we celebrate every single day. We celebrate little victories. We celebrate big anniversaries. We celebrate every day. But show us those things that are the most important. May you show us the celebrations of better love, better times of forgiveness, and better times of acceptance so that we may simply be a part of the family of Abraham, helping everyone to know their standing in your eyes, which is good and valuable and loved. We pray all of these things in the name of of the one who came to cause a problem to give us life. Amen.